Well, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Wildy Garden. And in this video I'm going to be answering a question that I get asked a hell of a lot and that is how to make a wildflower meadow in your own back garden. Now, for me, this is one of the key things that we should be focusing on. Yes, on the channel there are tons of videos that you can watch, of course, on how to make a wildlife pond and indeed they are probably the best habitat for wildlife. No, I'd go as far as saying they are the best thing you can do for wildlife in your own back garden because they provide life for so many animals, just too many to mention. But of course, all the usual culprits, you've got even bees will drink the water from a pond, um, birds, butterflies, many other insects, hedgehogs, badgers, foxes will all use it, toads, frogs, newts, dragonflies, damselflies, they are incredible. However, the next best thing you can do is to create a mini wildflower meadow. Now, the next question you're probably asking is, well, I can't create one because I don't have vast acres of land. Well, you don't need acres of land. I've created many wildflower meadows in what has been simply five or 10 square meters. So even if you've only got a two meter by two meter plot, that can be a mini wildflower meadow. Now, the benefits of just doing this, and even if you don't let your, uh, sorry, even if you don't cut your grass and you just let your lawn grow, you will be probably amazed as to how you can go about achieving this and amazed at what wildflowers are probably already there. Many lawns across the world, in fact, have probably been laid for many, many years, sometimes 40, 50 years. So what you will find in time is you get a lot of successional plants coming in and sort of blowing in on seed and therefore obviously starting to establish within your lawn. But because the lawn is mown continuously week after week after week through the summer, those wildflowers never actually either A, get the chance to flower, and if they do get the chance to flower, then they're probably not likely to be able to then go to seed because they will be cut, the heads will be cut before they actually can produce the seed and drop that seed and enable them to spread and continue and finish their life cycle. So by simply not mowing your lawn, you will probably be amazed as to how many wildflowers you might have in your lawn. Now, some of these will probably range from things like self-heal. I'm talking about the Northern, Northern Hemisphere here, and of course, particularly my experiences here in the UK, but things like self-heal, yarrow, bird's foot trefoil, red clover, daisies, dandelions, oxide daisies. The list is almost endless. I mean, it really is quite phenomenal how many plants you can find in lawn, even things such as, you know, pla uh, hoary plantain, uh, ribwort plantain, things like that. Obviously you get thistle species as well, but of course they're not going to be 90% of the time left to grow. So the first thing I would say, and as of course we are now entering May here in the UK, we have a no mow May, um, which is a fantastic hashtag and it's something that you really should be jumping on board with and I can't promote this enough. Although for me, I actually think it should be <laughs> no mow summer um, because having a wildflower meadow really can attract so much life into your garden. Um, so as I say, if you're not in a position either physically or financially to buy plants to um, put in your lawn or however the methods we're going to look at in a moment, if you're not in a position to do that, just simply don't cut the grass for May and just make a note of how many different plants you find that might be lurking in your lawn, waiting for the chance to pop up and obviously flower and produce lots of seeds to spread around. So if you can, please leave your lawn throughout the month of May when of course most things are growing and flowering and into June as well. If it's a success, then why mow it? Keep it going through the summer months and cut it down once in the autumn, once everything has flowered, usually September time. Um, I have done a video on the channel as to when is the best time to uh, mow a meadow or cut a meadow. So I'll put a link in to um, that video at the end of this video so that you can see. I'll touch roughly on maintenance afterwards uh, or to the end of, towards the end of this video, but of course it's one way you can then explore further what options you have when it comes to cutting your meadow and when. So in essence, creating a mini wildflower meadow is going to be very, very good for attracting a lot of wildlife. Not only will you get your obvious culprits, things like your uh, butterflies, your bees, your moths, hoverflies, normal flies, which of course are great pollinators, you'll get fantastic little things as well. Things like pollen beetles, uh, things like um, 
thick-thighed flower beetles <laughs> i think is the name i can never remember them they're a great insect though and uh bright green we get them here in the uk and they really look like they've you know been down the gym for about two years straight they're fantastic little beetles so all these kind of insects are going to be great at pollinating the plants that you put in your garden and therefore of course providing food for a lot of other insects um, and things further up the food chain as well you know birds will come into i mean the, the job i'm working on at the moment i saw sparrows descending on a not this job another job um, i saw barrow, sparrows descending on some long grass and they sort of vanish in the grass and I thought what they're doing then I realized they were actually going through the long grass excuse the plane noise they were going through the long grass and they were actually picking out spiders and other insects so by having long grass by having a wildflower meadow you're going to have all sorts of invertebrates living in there you'll attract things like wood mice field voles things like that which of course then in turn if you've got a bigger garden you may be fortunate enough to attract things like kestrels and barn owls to hunt around the margins of the garden if you're on the edge of a town for example if you've got bigger areas and you just leave them those sorts of birds will move in so they're great for mammals insects birds butterflies you name it meadows really do help so much wildlife and for things as well such as grass snakes to hunt through um, frogs as well really especially when they're young small frogs will really enjoy um, hunting through longer grass is a great place for them to start their life out when they come out of a pond and they start hunting through the grass for other insects things like um, smooth newts as well uh, they'll go through long grass of course once they finish their breeding season in a pond then they will move off into longer vegetation so really a lot of animals will use a wildflower meadow and it really will bring so much joy to your garden and wildlife so really can't shout about these things enough anyway that's a bit of the theory behind them it's a bit of of why you should have one in your garden and obviously the ways in which it will help wildlife now let's look at the practical side of things let's look at exactly how you can go about creating these wonderful habitats now the method i've used here is actually to plant nine centimeter potted plants straight into the lawn now if you're looking to buy these then we do obviously have the wild your garden online shop wildyourgarden.com where you can buy all the native wildflowers we've got here in the garden things like your oxide daisies bird's foot trefoil self heel red clover and the specific species we'll come on to in a moment but check out the wildyourgarden.com shop where you can get all of these wildflowers to plant in your own garden now I would always recommend putting nine centimeter potted plants into your garden over plugs now we do offer wildflower plugs as well but I just find when you are planting plants straight into the lawn um, they stand a much better chance because they've got a bigger more established root ball they have a much better chance of surviving against the existing grasses if you put a plug in quite often they can be swamped by the grasses and unfortunately you can spend a reasonable amount of money on you know tens dozens even maybe a couple of hundred plugs for the majority to be kind of swamped out by vigorous grasses because these plugs will obviously then have to try and establish their root system before they produce all the vegetation above ground so obviously the grass has the advantage of having already done that and having an established root structure so that come the springtime come april when things start growing again the grasses can shoot up and overtake the plugs so that's why having a better root um, ball if you like or, or a better root structure such as these nine centimeter pots you will give you the plants a lot better chance of surviving and competing with the grasses now you'll notice on this site that i have spread some subsoil and i'll put a clip in now of us topping up the or top dressing as it's known the area with subsoil now this is a new build housing estate and there was all sorts of bricks and things under the pond when we when we dug that uh, which is just out of shot but the lawn was very uneven as well so to make it a little bit easier for the clients to walk around this area and the idea is there's a mown pathway right around the edge around the margins uh, so that they can access the rest of the garden as herbaceous borders and new climbers and trees and shrubs that we planted all the way around the fences and new wire systems which we've put in to allow the climbers to grow up to create a living wall but to access all of that they need obviously a mown strip they can get around so there is actually the option to mow a strip all the way around the edge which is what they'll be doing through the summer months so the majority of the planting is therefore within the central part of this lawn area so that most of the flowers can obviously flower and go carry out their life cycle uh, without being cut down but coming back to the top dressing i wanted to just explain i've done that with a poor subsoil and if you are looking for any subsoil uh, we now do have that on the wildger garden website we have two lights we have a, a types we have a sandy loam and a loamy sand they're different applications generally speaking um, 
the sandy loam is better for a lawn situation because it's more sand based and a loamy sand is slightly better for uh, the margins of a wildlife pond so we do have those two options available so do get in touch if you're looking to work out sort of quantities and let us know your areas we can obviously help you out with all of that and supply you with these um, bags of of subsoil which of course work wonders um, when it comes to trying to establish a meadow or establish a wildlife pond both of those elements of which thrive on low fertility it's very very important i mean if you have you know really really lush soils in particular maybe under an orchard um, or sort of the understory in an orchard can quite often with all the vegetation that drops over the years apples and all the fruit plums and everything else that rots down with all the leaves quite often orchards are very very fertile so if you're trying to establish a meadow under an orchard and in particular with the shade cover as well that's added to that situation it can be quite tricky and there obviously would be a lot of fertility in the ground so therefore your grasses are going to get quite tall and you need some big shade tolerant plants plants such as um, uh, red campion you know and lesser knapweed which are going to do well in those situations and get quite big um, so if I just move my leg before it falls off <laughs> um, yeah so one of the reasons you need to have that low fertility is just to try and establish these plants now don't worry if you you know you don't have to strip off all the turf which is another method you may have heard me mention or you may have seen me use in previous videos and i will incidentally be putting another video on uh, in the coming weeks of one or two of the bigger projects that i've done of the one or two acre sites which is quite interesting to watch where there's a lot of kind of machinery those of you that love your big machines and your toys <laughs> that's one for you but also very fascinating to see how we can turn a patch of basically mown grass into a wildflower meadow on a big scale so one two more videos coming up like that on the channel soon so stay tuned for that um, so you can of course strip the turf if you think your lawn is very very fertile and the grasses get two or three foot tall and nothing's really going to compete with that and you're a bit concerned you can of course either mechanically or by hand the hard way <laughs> i've done it in the olden days obviously now luckily i have a lot of machinery to help me with this kind of thing but of course you guys don't um, but if you're struggling with fertility then you can strip it off by hand and get down even if you just take the top three or four inches off it will help reduce that fertile layer and then you can plant straight into the porous subsoils underneath which of course will be easier for these plants they might not enjoy it as much and a lot of these wildflowers will grow well in fertile rich soil of course but they will therefore be competing with other things such as nettles thistles docks which need that fertility because they're such big leafy bushy plants they need to produce a lot of foliage so they need a lot of energy and a lot of fertility so if you remove that fertility you are therefore creating an environment where these plants aren't going to the bully plants if you like not that i'm saying there's anything wrong because nettles thistles and docks all have their uses in the natural world as larval food plants and as nectar sources um but they're not obviously an ideal for a general garden setting something such as this although i would encourage one or two to be kept around the borders if you can and just snip the heads off in time you know and remove them before they go once they flower but before they go to seed then you can have these plants without them spreading around too much i digress slightly but so the the point is the lower the fertility the better these plants is plants are going to have at thriving and spreading through the meadow so you can strip the turf off and you can get down to the poorer subsoil layers and as I say you don't need to do this but if you're concerned about fertility you can but in this situation we've just added a bit of a top dressing the soil wasn't massively fertile and the grasses that have established here within the original turf that was laid with the house a couple of years ago isn't actually that thick of grass it's not the thick kind of perennial rye grasses or anything like that that are really kind of a brute species that create big uh, they're clump forming perennial grass um, it's quite sort of thin fine sort of fescues so it's not bad actually and we can quite easily plant within uh, the grass so that these plants can establish quite well without too much competition so the top dressing was added mostly as a, a kind of a leveling out procedure to enable a bit more easier <laughs> traveling around the site without too many undulations from the existing turf and the way the garden had been leveled before um, but obviously it's good as well because then that creates a seed bed so that in between the nine centimeter potted plants uh, nine centimeter potted plants that we've planted in this garden already there are bare patches of soil with a nice fine tilth 
uh, which we can then sow wildflower seed in between as well. So if you've got that opportunity, it is a really good one because it means you can add additional grasses and wildflowers relatively cheaply to the area because you've got that lovely fine tilth. Now we are into May, it is a little bit late for sowing seed, but with a little bit of water and a little bit of care, um, they will come up fine. I've not seeded this area yet, uh, but I will do after this video, and then the clients will water it periodically just to help everything germinate. Obviously May is a good time for germination. Uh, just It's very warm at the moment, it's about 22 degrees today. So and obviously we've had quite a warm April as well. Hence these plants are looking a little bit wilty one or two of them just the oxide daisies in particular but they will perk up once they've had a drink uh, of course they're going into hard baked ground at the moment so uh, not the ideal situation anyway so we've got the subsoil that we have spread and that's literally just a case of tipping it on with a wheelbarrow spreading it about with a rake and also there were many wildflowers within this another reason we didn't strip it there were many wildflowers within this area uh, things such as dandelions uh, there's one or two ragwort which is a little bit controversial um, but of course you can have it and people obviously don't like it in the garden because of um, the seeding potential to then go into fields um, obviously where you there may be horses now um, Horses, I um, don't want to digress too much, but horses, uh, any, of, any of you wondering, horses won't actually eat ragwort on its own stood up in a field. They'll eat around it. It's when that field is cut and baled, and obviously the ragwort stems and flowers are tied in with all that hay. They can't really distinguish it from the rest of the feed. So ragwort can be a problem, and I appreciate that. Any of you people that have got horses out there, I'm not trying to promote ragwort in, <laughs> blowing into your fields but obviously you can have them in a the garden if you were to then do, as I've just mentioned, uh, cut the heads off just before they go to flower so that you can get the best of both. You're providing a lovely nectar plant for things such as a gatekeeper butterfly, but you're also then removing the head to stop them spreading by seed. So there's one or two of those in this garden which will be mitigated. Uh, there's also dandelions as well, and there's other little bits of plants dotted around that we wanted to kind of leave because um, dandelions as well, if you haven't seen already on the video, on the channel, do check out that video. Um, part of the Nomo May and part of the campaign that uh, I think should be, well, just goes without saying, is to not mow dandelions and not try and eradicate them from lawns. So check out that video if you haven't already. Um, but yeah, so the plants that we are planting in this meadow, let's come on to that now. Now that we've took, talked a little bit about the the hows and whys of how you should be achieving this um, and obviously I will be doing another video in time incidentally of a full kind of stripping a garden and rotivating it and seeding it of course if you're looking to do that kind of a thing September is usually your best time um, spring sowings have you know limited success particularly when we get weather like this and it's very hot and you're not, you're not able to water the whole area so I will be doing more videos on that in time but this method as I say is using a nine centimeter potted plant and planting straight into the lawn now I'm going to have a go at doing one of these now um, so I'm just going to change the camera angle so you guys can see a bit easier and we'll look at exactly how to do that okay so for this section of the video you're going to need yourself one times trowel and obviously a nine centimeter potted plant in this case a cowslip now i'll come on to what plants you should be planting in your lawn to create a mini wildflower meadow in a moment but i just wanted to show you the principle behind it so nice little trowel if you can or a little um, narrow spade and hopefully you'll be doing this into ground that's not quite as baked as this <laughs> but it is doable with a little bit of chopping as you can see and you can see some of the grass underneath when you are top dressing you don't need to put inches and inches on just kind of fill in the dips um, and just put an inch or two over the top then that way any existing plants can grow through it most of the time and then you don't lose everything oh, you can see it's quite a, quite a clay soil underneath this fine subsoil on top is a blessing but it disguises a multitude of sins and of course most of the plants that I'm going to be recommending to you in a moment are good for most soil types so hence the species I'm going to be recommending so dig your hole a little bit bigger than your actual pot itself which is taking a bit of doing I'm not gonna lie I usually use a spade for this but it's a bit difficult to show you that with a camera setup as it is and go a little bit deeper than you want as well and also when you get to the bottom of your hole just loosen the soil up a bit so the roots can establish properly i have done another uh, video as well that i'll put a link to at the end of uh, how to plant a tree and shrubs in your garden so um, do check that out then just squeeze the pot 
sometimes they're a little bit pot bound this one's not too bad there you go look another fine specimen from the wildy garden shop so again if you're looking for these or if you're looking to get some of these then that's the place to go and then just make sure when you're planting it you want your soil level to be level with or very just slightly above the existing soil level on the actual nine centimeters pot because they've that's what that's the level they've been used to growing at so if you fill up the soil and come up the stem they're not going to enjoy it it could potentially rot rot the stem off itself so it's important to put the pot in the ground the same level as the top of your soil in your pot so just check if check it first that's about right i can just put a little bit of soil back so luckily this is quite crumbly stuff a little bit back in the bottom and then just hold the leaves up so you're kind of pulling them up out of the way and then just pull the soil back around with your hands simple as that and then just give it a good firm you don't want to be trampling on this with your foot with your foot they are quite delicate of course so just firm it in with your fingers and then just as i say if you've got any big lumps just crumble them up level the soil out plenty of firming in voila one times wildflower i'll do it again just so you can see with this primrose which will be plant species number two that i'll be talking to you about let me uh, come further back a bit so you can see a bit easier. Well, that was a bit easier to dig that on. A bit softer ground there. So again, I've just gone a bit, a bit deeper and a bit wider than I need, so you can get some soil around it. That's as height wise is about right and then just make sure your soil is crumbled up before you push it back around the sides because if you just put a couple of clumps of soil back down and just shove it down the side you might be leaving air pockets so which is not great for the plant because then the roots can't connect with the soil and start extracting moisture from the soil so if you can get some crumbly stuff the old turf you can quite often just turn upside down and plant next to the plant so uh, sorry just just pat it down next to the plant and that will kill the grass off around it creating a nice little area around your plant of grass-free lawn or grass-free soil that you can then give the plant a bit better chance of establishing so there's two examples now let's look at what plants you should be planting so there are many 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 types of wildflowers that you can put into your own mini meadow and for a full definitive list i would recommend getting yourself a copy of the wild your garden book um, which is my book that i wrote a couple of years ago which if you didn't know about is available on the online shop wildyourgarden.com so do get yourself a copy of that it's got every plant listed you could ever possibly want to encourage wildlife into your garden from the trees the shrubs the herbaceous perennials in your borders what climbers to use plants for shade plants for sun plants for clay soils wet dry any situation pond plants as well it's a really really definitive guide as to what you can put in your garden to attract wildlife and some of the benefits that each individual plant has so yes do check out wild your garden and every book that is sold through the website wildyourgarden.com um, i will be signing every copy sold so if you're looking for maybe uh, a gift for somebody then perhaps that's a good way of helping wildlife and uh, yeah if you want a personal message i can do that as well so wildyourgarden.com check out the wild your garden book for full definitive list in this video however though i want to talk to you about a few of my favorites and some of the ones that have gone into this garden so let's start with a cracking midsummer plant now this is lesser knapweed or black knapweed it's not flowering yet it's not quite ready to flower in the wider countryside um, but this is a really really good plant midsummer plant that's attractive to so many insects in terms of the pollen and the nectar available absolutely cracking plant this is um, creates a decent sort of bushy herbaceous perennial comes back year after year it'll grow in most soil types of sandy clay whatever and it'll also grow in semi-shade as well so uh, or full sun so a really versatile plant and one that is an absolute magnet for many many insects mid-season so a really good one for a mid-season summer flowering meadow then if we move on to one of my favorite springtime plants look at this beauty it's a little bit wilty because it's uh, needing a drink but it is a cracking plant this is red campion and red campion is one of my favorite springtime plants it's just so good 
for so many insects, particularly uh, brimstone butterfly, my favourite, the orange tip, um, all the white species as well, green vein, large and small. And it's just a really, really good nectar source. A lot of bees use it as well and very, very reliable. So it'll grow well in shade, a really, really good plant for shade. If anybody ever asks me what a good plant for shade is, I always recommend this plant first. Uh, it, because it's brilliant. We've planted some in the border behind me and it really does do well in a shady setting. As well as full sun, it'll do well in as well. Um, and the beauty of this plant, what I absolutely love about it, one of my favourite things to do, is to, um, when the flowers have just finished, they create these like little mini cauldron, cauldrons, uh, like a witch's cauldron you know, of, of seed, um, where if you just gently pluck them off vertically, don't tip them upside down because you'll lose all the seed, but then put your hand flat and tip the seeds into your hand. They're lovely, kind of these little, almost like grey black cannonballs. <laughs> it's just fantastic. Um, a bit like poppy seeds, but on a bigger scale. Um, and they're really, really good at germinating from seeds. So just literally scatter these through your border. A great way of producing many more wildflowers very cheaply. <laughs> in fact, it won't cost you a penny. So once you've got one or two of these in the garden, wait till they finish flowering, pick off the heads, and then just sprinkle the seeds all through your borders, and they'll just create a carpet of pink. Really long flowering period. They'll flower from April, May, and into June, and they are just wonderful as a nectar source early on. So can't recommend these enough. So Red Campion, get yourself some of that. Now, this could possibly be entered into the Guinness World Records for the biggest plant in a nine centimetre pot. <laughs> This is, of course, the Oxide Daisy, which, as you can see, has these gorgeous little, well, I say little, they're a good size. It's like a daisy on steroids, basically. Fantastic plant. Again, does well in semi-shade. This one is well ready for being planted on. This has been in the pot for a year longer than it should have been. Don't worry, yours won't be this big or bushy or in need of potting on if you order them from the shop. <laughs> this is one of the ones that I grew from seed, actually. Uh, that was in the greenhouse so yes I'm going to take this one back give it a good cut back because it's just a bit big for going in this meadow area but I wanted to show you this as a good example as to the height and spread they can get so a really really cracking wildflower great for butterflies such as the common blue brown argus love to nectar on it and loads of other insects as well hoverflies as well because it's got a nice flat flower head all the hoverflies will like to use it pollen beetles as well really 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 good as a plant for a garden and again most flat, uh, most soil types so clay sand whatever it'll grow it'll grow almost anywhere you know i've seen it in cracks in pavements and things i've also seen it you know in semi-shady settings as well so it, it will go, go well in sun or shade really really good plant so oxide daisy plant number three can't even put it down now <laughs> um then we've already looked at the cowslip let me grab one from here the cowslip, possibly my favourite springtime plant, maybe, along with garlic mustard, goes without saying. Um, yes, the cowslip, really, really good plant. Loves calcareous soil, so is particularly does particularly well on sort of uh, chalk or limestone grassland, but it'll also do really well on sand. I've also done a video on the cowslip recently at a wildflower meadow I created 12 years ago, so check that out if you haven't. These things are just everywhere over there at the moment. These are just going over now, as you can see, uh, but I'll put a couple of clips in of just what they look like in numbers. They are a stunning plant, and one that will do um, reasonably well in clay as well. Uh, and good in shade they'll do well in full sun but they'll also do good in shade so another really versatile plant that it doesn't really matter and again most of these plants that i'm picking out for your plants that you can grow no matter where you are in the country uh, or in the northern hemisphere they will work really well in most soil types so cowslips and of course they are the larval food plant for the duke of burgundy butterfly which i went to see recently and um I got one, but it eluded me a little bit, so I didn't quite get a photo of it. Uh, but I'll put a clip in of that cracking little butterfly, the only metal mark butterfly we have here in the UK. So, cowslip, really good one for your garden. Definitely get some of that in your um, in your meadow. And I'm going to grab, no, I'm not, I've planted it. I've planted the only one I was going to show you, so you'll have to put up with some stills. <laughs> Primrose was going to be my next one. Obviously, when you're looking to create these meadows and these areas, you want to try and create a um a longevity of flower so you want to be flowering from when the first bumblebees emerge and they're looking for a drink of nectar to when the last red admirals are leaving the country and heading south on their migration back to the continent so to do that you're going to be needing to use some of these plants and obviously primroses are really good they're out 
sort of March, early March, and they are just a fantastic plant for so many butterflies as well. Things such as the prim brimstone butterfly, which is one of our first butterflies to emerge here in the UK, they love a good drink on primrose. And the primrose, again, does very well in shade. It'll do okay in sun. Uh, most soil types as well, a really good versatile plant and a fantastic splash <coughs> Excuse me, of lemon yellow at this time of year. Now, my last plant, my absolute favourite wildflower. If you didn't know, this is bird's foot trefoil. This is just such a brilliant plant. Now, I don't think there's many plants that could be classed as a larval food plant for so many butterflies. Um, things such as the common blue will use it. You'll get green hair streak will use it. Dingy skipper will use it. Again, the last two, not really butterflies you're likely to get in your garden but they will use it in the wider countryside. Um, moth, you've got the day flying moth, six spot bonnet moth will use it. So what a fantastic plant. And the bees absolutely love the nectar available on a bird's foot trefoil. They just create these wonderful low growing yellow mats and uh, they uh, just are a cracking plant. They'll grow in most situations. They prefer well-drained soils, um, but if you've got a damp area, you can of course use the um, the bigger brother of this, the greater bird's foot trefoil, which is a beast of a plant. It'll grow absolutely huge. Bird's foot trefoil, definitely get some of this in a meadow. It, in no meadow would be complete without bird's foot trefoil. Again, great as a nectar source as well, like I say, and uh, just a wonderful, wonderful plant. It's just brilliant, an absolute magnet for many, many insects. So bird's foot trefoil, low growing herbaceous perennial, really good. So. Those are most of the common plants that we've planted in here. There are other things such as self-heal as well, which is really good for bees. You've probably got it in your lawn, quite a common plant. Grows to you know an inch or two high, lovely purpley blue flower, similar to bugle, um, but does very well in dry situations. So we've got some uh, self-heal in here. What else have we got? Um, that's, that's about it, I think. Always the way, isn't it? You get a coughing fit right when you're in the middle of speaking. <laughs> anyway, I... Um, I was just trying to kind of round things up there by saying that's the majority of the plants we've got in this area. So recap, we've got self-heal, cowslip, primrose, oxide daisy, lesser knapweed, red campion and bird's foot trefoil. So bird's foot trefoil. Seven really, really good plants to be including in a meadow. Of course, you can include things such as red clover, uh, wild carrot, agrimony, uh, ladies bed straw many many species and as i say check out the wild your garden book for a full list of what you can put in your garden and of course most of these as i say are available on the wild your garden website so check that out if you're looking to create one of these they really really are an incredible habitat i mean why mow your lawn constantly through the year when you can have something that all right this doesn't look its best at the moment but the flowers are just starting to come out the oxides are just starting to flower you cannot beat these as a habitat. I personally would much rather look at a wildflower meadow than a mown lawn any day of the week. So I really hope this video has given you some inspiration to go out there and create your own mini meadow. As I say, don't worry if you've only got 10 square meters to play with. It really is as simple as planting a few plants in your lawn and seeing what happens. And not only that, if you've only got a balcony, if you're in the middle of a city, do not despair. You can, of course, create this effect just by planting a few pots. And I've done videos on the channel, of course, as to how you can plant uh, a little mini pot for pollinators, shall we say. So do check that out. And um, yeah, don't despair if you are on a, in a flat 10 stories up. You can still help wildlife. So thank you so much for watching, guys. As always, please, if you've got any comments or questions, do put them below and I'll do my best to answer them. Obviously, in terms of maintenance, I'll touch on that briefly before we end. Um, the beauty of this is you don't have to cut them at all throughout the summer season. Just cut them back once in the autumn and that's all you have to do. As long as you remove the cuttings so you're not encouraging um, that vegetation to rot down. If you mulch it and let it rot, it'll just smother the wildflowers and in time they can sort of peter out. Cut and collect. You can either cut it and collect it with a mower or stream it, but do check for wildlife in your meadow, any frogs, voles, anything like that before you put a strimmer through. Of course, they can be quite lethal to a lot of animals. Um, so just as long as it's cut and collected, usually in September or October, that's it. They're as simple as that. So not only are they less work than mowing a lawn, they look better than mowing a lawn, and they're better for wildlife. Why wouldn't you want one in your own garden? 
I honestly don't understand why you wouldn't. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for watching, guys. Really appreciate the support. Feel free to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Give the video a like, and I'll be sure to bring you many, many more videos on all the ways in which you can help wildlife in your own garden in videos to come. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.